Hi. 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 Say you, are, you are welcome to another lecture for the week. Thank you, sir. With, uh, Dr. Shaban. So we are continuing where we ended last week. This, this afternoon, we are looking at female reproductive system. And I don't know whether last week we started it, but that is on my record for female reproductive Reproductive system is up to. Yeah, please, it seems your voice is a little bit far away, far away from us. I said, I don't know whether last week we started it. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We go to the clitoris. That's fine. So it means we start the vulva. Let me recap what we did last week. Female reproductive system is made up of two different genitalia. We have external genitalia and internal genitalia. The external genitalia it's what we see when a woman normally goes naked. And when we say woman, including the children, female children, you know, who, when they go naked, you see external genitalia. The internal genitalia is not seen like that unless you actually displace external genitalia. So we started last week, and then we started with the vulva. We started with the vulva. And we are continuing the vulva. This is the diagram you can see there is the female reproductive system, vulva. Just do it. You see some hair somewhere at the top there. And then you see some flap of skins. Uh, and then you see the enos. You see the what we call Bamashua. So we started that. We talk about Mount Veneris covered with hair. Short hair, of course. Same color, the hair, same color like the scalp. Scalp. Now we look at labia majora, also covered with hair. And then we look at labia minora, which is also labia without the hair. Labia minora stretches over the clitoris, and the name of the structure it forms we call parapus. The other person beneath it to form the cranium. Posteriorly, the labia minora are fused posteriorly. With our lecture, view a woman standing or a woman lying dorsally. When we say posteriorly, we are talking of the back. You know, labia minora form faucet. We talked about that last week. As I was made to understand, we ended at clitoris. So let's the lecture starts. Uh, the clitoris after clitoris. One thing we know about the clitoris is it contains erectile tissues. And I think last week I said some people, some cultures, some religious cultures, cut the clitoris. The clitoris is supposed to be very sensitive and it's supposed to encourage love making so that God Almighty will create but some people cut it. Clitoris can be as long as 2.5 centimeters or more. And um, now when you 
leave the clitoris, you come down. Assuming the woman is lying in the lithotomy position, and you displace labia majora, you know, and labia minora, you have an area which look like almond shape, if you know almond shaped area. And that is between the labia majora and clitoris, when you displace labia minora, clitoris. In that shape, you see a hole. One is for uterine meatus, one is for vagina, and another, that, that of greater vascular glands. These holes are very important in obstetrics. Urethra, when a woman has urine in the bladder, normally the, it's catheterized. And when you go to the almond shell vegetable, you see a hole at the top. For you to be very sure, it is a urethra for you to put the catheter. You go up and then you see the clitoris. It just after clitoris, you come down, then you see that hole. Then after this, you see another hole, which is vagina hole. That is the neotus we are talking about, small opening, about 2.5 below the clitoris. The urethral canal passes upwards and backwards, about 3.5 centimeters to the neck of the bladder, to the side and slightly behind the urethral neotus. Uh, two small openings, that is the urethral neotus. When you see that hole, we have an orifice of skin duct, please take note of it. Skin duct, skin duct, that's very important. When you are reading your nose, that's very important. Please take note of it. They appear as a small dimples with the neotus, which has a slightly raised margin between them. Then you move on to vagina orifice, just below down the urethral orifice, which are found in the vestibule. And this occupy the posterior to test of the vestibule. The orifice is partially closed by the hymen. Vagina orifice. In a, in a young lady, a woman, you know, who has not done any sexual intercourse, it is partially closed for so many reasons. God has made it in a such a way that it is closed so that any microorganism found, found outside will not be able to enter the vagina. But this hymen is broken during sexual intercourse and during the birth of the first child. If the woman, the girls escape, the uh, the breaking of the hymen, you will not be able to escape each uh, tearing the first when you delivering for the first child. So hymen protect the vagina. Hymen prevent will protect the prevent microorganism from entering the vagina. It's a thin membrane. Partly close, occlude the opening of the vagina. And it is usually perforated centrally. Usually, when you go to dining of the hand, you see that that one of the problems is that uh, it's easily get infected. Now we have these structures, but we call greater vascular glands or bottles. Greater vestibular glands or battlings, battlings glands. Remember, all these are external genitalia. You know, the, these glands lie, this battlings gland lie in labia majora, labia majora. One on each side, you know, labia majora has two flat skins. So one on each side has battlings glands. Glands produce secretions. They are about the same size 
of a small pier and covered with dense fibrous tissues. They are ducts which lead from the glands and open into the vestibule. The bacillus glands, they open into the vestibule. What is their function? Anytime we meet a structure, I want you to take note. Is the function of the structure you should be interested in. The glass secrete mucus, which lubricate the vulva. Mont veneris, labia majora, labia minora, uh, vestibule, the, the, uh, this almond shape structure with the goose there. And then if that those structures are dry, the woman will not be able to even to put on her panties. So God has given us all uh, the women battlers, and they produce secret to make the place wet. This gland, unfortunately, are easily infected. And sometimes you have what we call battlers cysts, battlers cysts. Remember, we have, when we talk of labia manora, labia labias. Labia manora is a thin fold of skin behind the vagina orifice, where the labias meet. Labia, labia manora meet. At the, where the labia manora meet, they form a structure we call faucet. This faucet is formed by labia manora. And we take it when we come to labor, this structure is very, very important. Sometimes affected green liver. Then we have perineum. Perineum, this is the area of the skin which covers the perineal body. Now you ask, what is perineal body? The perineal body is that the, from the vagina down to the anus, that area. To the vagina down to the anus. That area is called perineal body. And it's called the, the, the perineum is the skin that covering the perineal body. Start from the faucet to the anus. The faucet formed by labia manora down there, then you come down to the end of that area. It's perineum. Remember this perineum. And perineal body is very important in labor. Sometimes when the woman is delivering the head of the baby, perineum becomes very, very difficult. And what is very, very difficult, what the midwife will do is to cut through the perineum, which we normally call episiotomy. You know, but most of the time the midwife put her hands in the vagina posterior part of the where the faucet is pressed down and then deliver the head of the baby. Then we have vestibular balls. You know, we have vestibule. These are two small connections of vascular erector tissues. Vascular erector tissues. This, this vestibular, uh, vascular ball has erector tissues and situated on either side of the vagina or if you deep in labia majora. You know, it is, it is said to be a continuation of the main body of the clitoris. You know, clitoris had been endowed with erectile tissues. So, so it continues to the entrance of the vagina so that the vagina will have some erectile tissue and then some uh, stimulation so that when a man is having sexual intercourse with the woman, the woman will feel that somebody is having sexual intercourse with her so that she'll be able to contain it, then get what she's supposed to get, and then get the eggs this, uh, fertilized, and then she becomes pregnant. If those erectile tissues are not there, that of clitoris and that of vascular valves, Remember, the woman will not be interested in sex. I teach you to read about blood supply of the vulva, but let's look at pathological condition. What we describe is normal. 
Some, when you, a woman comes to antenatal clinic and then you send her to the table to examine her vulva, these are some of the things that, some of the things that you should look out for. One, we already saw battles, and then we said it can easily get infected because the infection of the battles and battles sex or abscess. The vulva can also have what we have vulnerable words or what we call condylomata. The third possible pathological condition of the vulva is edema, especially the labia. Labia majora, you know, can easily become, you know, swollen during, during some during pregnancy, especially in common in the pregnancy induced hypertension, which we call preeclampsia. The vulva can itch, you know, and most of the itching of the vagina, the vulva is a discharge coming from the vagina. It can infect the vagina orifice, infect the almond shape structure, come from clitoris, everything. And the woman will have some itching. Anytime you are in an uh, antenatal clinic and the woman is scratching herself, especially around her uh, uh, private area, then she know that something is happening to her. Can be a vagina crash, trachomonal vaginitis. If you diagnose this, she can easily be treated. Then we have pruritus vulva. It's also itching found, especially from can candida. The candida of albicans. Then sometimes when you are inspecting the vulva of the woman, especially labia majora, you see a small sore. And some, if you want to know what type of sore, take a spatula or any hard thing, scratch on it, and you see the woman enjoying it. it, it, it you have to conclude that it is syphilitic sore. Syphilis has been a problem in formerly, and it's still a problem now, of course. But uh, with the advent of HIV, some of these things are not popular, but they are very dangerous. A woman who has a syphilis and is pregnant, this condition can easily affect the baby. The woman also develops varicose veins, varicose veins on the vulva. And normally it affects the labia majora and minora. When a woman and then when a woman gets varicose veins, labia majora and minora, it's very dangerous. I have to take action. And that's what I will say is that with the varicose veins on these structures. If the woman advances in pregnancy, you book her for delivery in a hospital. Or if she has these veins around and she delivers in the house, or she delivers in a maternity home, or any hospital that doesn't go to the theater, what will happen is that if it ruptures, the, the veins rupture. The woman is going to bleed. And if that village or that hospital no vehicle to transport her to the nearest hospital, and you can imagine what will happen. So we don't in in antenatal clinic, we don't just inspect things like that. You look at it and advise appropriately. So that comes to the end of the vulva description. We now move on to internal genitalia. Internal genitalia. Any question on vulva? Hello? Hi, sir. So we can, uh, we can go at, yes? Then we can proceed. All right, thank you. Now we go to internal genitalia. 
When you put the woman on the table and you display the labia majora, you display the labia minora, you see the almond shape, the small, and then you look and you see the you see the vagina orifice, vagina orifice. That is where the 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 internal organs begins. And look at the arrangement. In the examination, they can make an arrangement. The, the, the internal organ doesn't start with fallopian tubes or ovaries, or you, it goes from vagina, you move on to uterus, you move on to fallopian tubes, and you go to ovaries. So we start with the vagina. This is the reproductive system, female reproductive system. Now you see the vagina there, see the uterus there, you see the fallopian tubes, and you get the ovaries. We are going to look at all of them, and then later on look at them when the woman is pregnant, what happens to them. Vagina is described as a dialectable canal. It's a canal. Vagina is described as dilatable canal, which leads from the vulva to the uterus. Let me go back. Look at it. From the vulva to the uterus, the, see that it joined to the uterus. It's a dilatable canal. Why is it dilatable? We see, and it's very important that vagina should be dilatable in that. Uh, uh, the baby coming <laughs> is so big that if the vagina can stretch, I wonder whether the woman will be able to deliver. And more importantly, there is no woman who determines the size of her husband's penis before he marries the woman, the man. So God has created the situation where it's dilatable to receive anything or to bring out anything from it. And it's situated in true pelvis. Immediately we finish this, so we go to pelvis. The pelvis is divided into two. We have four pelvis and three pelvis, but uh, vagina is in the true pelvis. The true pelvis. And this is shaped anatomically 55% to sister horizontally to the, to the woman. It is parallel to the brain of the pelvis. When we do pelvis and you are reversing this place, you understand. It is almost at the right angles to the uterus. Vagina is, if you picture the, uh, what do we call it? An angle, the, the vagina horizontally and uterus is on, on it. It's almost at the right angle. The walls are always touching each other. Each upper end of vault is attached to the cervix of the uterus. Let me repeat here. I think we were doing terms. I mentioned it. In our strategy, we divide vagina into three. We have lower vagina, which is just near the vulva, middle vagina, and upper vagina. Upper vagina is very close to the cervix. Lower, middle, and upper vagina. The upper vagina has another we call a vault. Because it's a tube, it's a canal. The posterior wall is 10 centimeters long. And the anterior wall is 7.5 long. And the reason is that someone who has even said, if it's a canal tube, why can't they be the same? Uh, the same length. Anterior wall is 7.5 long as the cervix leans. Cervix is found to be inside the vagina. It leans on the vagina. So it has reduced the, the, the length of the anterior wall. The cervix of the uterus project into the vagina at the right angles. This makes the anterior wall shorter than the posterior wall. It always results in the formation of four pockets. Posterior phonics is the deepest and the anterior phonics is the smallest. And then we have the lateral phonics. 
The lower end of the vagina is partly closed, as we said, by hammer. But let me go back for you to see the diagram. And then you see the, let me show you, that is the vagina. That is the posterior wall. And that is anterior wall. And this where my, the arrow is, is the phonics. Is the phonics and phonics. And you see, this part of the uterus you see just now is cervix and it's inside the vagina. So it has created make this one longer than this one. I hope you've seen what I'm trying to show. So the posterior wall and anterior wall are not the same in length, and also they are not. Uh, they, they've also created phonics. When you look inside the vagina without the microscope, you use the speculum to raise the vagina. You see the lining of vagina pinkish, pink, when seen with the naked eyes. And it forms folds, and these folds are called rugae. If these folds which actually made the vagina dilatable because of the fold you can stretch. It's not a straight wall. It is thrown into folds. And as we said, this rugae allows for stretching during the childbirth. So the rugae, but what you should know is that with the subsequent birth, that stretch, that stretch property of the vagina normally goes away. So that is, that is the rugae. But when you go microscopically, vagina has four walls, you know, starting from inside, you get um, uh, stratified epithelium, which is similar to the skin. Then you get vascular elastic connective tissue, that's the second layer on the vagina. Then you get uh, weak muscular layer, which has inner circular fibers and lutinal fibers. And of course, the last layer is pelvic fascia, which can circle the vagina and circle the vagina. You know, say, tube, so it's a circle. So, so when you go outside, inside, you get, you get the pelvic fascia, weak muscular uh, layer, which made up of two muscles circular and longitudinal muscles. Then you have vascular elastic. Then you have stratified epithelium. So stratified epithelium, vascular elastic from inside, outside, weak muscular layer, and pelvic fascia. Now, all the structures we, we do in our structures, in, in our, in course of our lecture, we should know that structures are not living alone. They are not there alone. There are certain structures which are surrounding them, which also play part in a obstetric cycle, especially during labor. One, when you look at uh, anterior, the woman lying dorsal, and the tube of the placenta in the edge, the tube of the vagina, and the, on the top of the vagina, we call it anterior. Upper half, upper half of the, you get the base of the bladder. And then lower half, you have the urethra. And then upper third, you know, the, the, the sorry, from the, something is missing there. When you have the nose, you can see you put there that that should have been the posterior. Posterior. Let me repeat again. Anterior has two relations: the base of the bladder and the lower half is the urethra. Then posterior, you have the porch of Douglas. Then you have the rectum, and then the last part of it, you have the perineum body. We are talking from, we are 
speaking from the upper vagina area, upper vagina area, where the vault is. The anterior, you have the base of the bladder, then the lower half, you have the urethra. Then posterior, you have the rectum uterum porch, which we call porch of Douglas. And then we have the rectum, that is the, the when the woman is lying down, lying dorsally, the, the down pine, where the buttocks are. Then you have the rectum and then perineal body. Securely, so that the top of the vagina, you get the cervix. I've showed you the cervix goes into the vagina. And the inferiorly, that the down part of the vagina, you have the hymen. The lateral part of the vagina <coughs> has the pelvic fascia, then blood vessels, nerves, and ureters. Blood supply to the vagina, anything blood supply, venous supply, the please. I want you to read, especially when you have the nose. You can get everything. And we can ask you questions on them. Venous return with blood vessels and veins supply to the vagina. Lymphatic drainage. And then we come to nerve supply. Now what we are going to look at the content of vagina. Content of vagina. What is inside the vagina? There are no glands situated in the walls, oh, but the vagina contains fluid. I'm repeating. No glands. A structure without the glands will not have secretion. But vagina has secretions. And where is this secretion coming from? The supply is coming from cervix, and another supply is coming from blood vessels in the vagina. Again, the glands of the cervix supply the secretion. In, inside vagina is not dry, it has secretion. The vagina has no glands. So the secretion is coming from the cervix and the blood vessels in the vagina. This secretion, which is supplied from the cervix, has a pH. It's acidic, has a pH of 4.5. Where from this pH? Where from this acid? Vagina has a bacteria or some, we call it dodelans, dodelans, bacilli. You know, they are living with women, they are living with women vagina symbiotically. When we say symbiotic the the vagina supply this this uh, bacteria, they are uh, this microorganism, what we call glycogen, to live, and in the process when it metabolizes glycogen, it produces an acid, which we call lactic acid which make the vagina secretion 4.5. Can you imagine? 4.5, very strong acid. It is not just because, you know, God is being good. It is it, it's acid because as soon as the hymen is broken, microorganisms will have an opportunity to enter the vagina just like that. So God in his own wisdom provided this to produce acid to the vagina acidity. Acidity destroys most of the pathogenic organisms. Most, I said most, because sometimes if the uh, bacteria invasion is too high, sometimes the acid will not be able to work for the woman and she will get infection of the vagina. Has vagina got any function at all? Yes. Vagina acidity, you know, vagina acidity kills certain pathological organ organism. What is it? What is it? What is it? Why is it important? It's important because if vagina acidity is not there, any microorganism that will invade the vagina 
who continue to the uterus and continue to the fallopian tube and even go to the ovaries and then create problem for the woman. So vagina is protecting other organs. It also promotes menstrual flow. Menstruation blood or menstrual blood does not come from the vagina. Women does women do not do not uh, uh, what do we call menstruate from vagina. They menstruate from the uterus. You know the, the uterus where the menstruation takes place. But the blood that has to come as a result of the menstruation passed through the vagina to outside. Third point, every examination to be done to know something about the woman's reproductive system and pelvis is done through vagina. I remember if you want to have sexual intercourse with a woman, you do that through vagina. It helps also to stretch, to stretch. The baby is not found in the vagina. But the baby is found in uterus, and when the woman is ready to deliver, it, it stretches and allows the baby to pass through. So these are some of the very important functions. Now you ask yourself, why is it that in antenatal clinic, in the labor world, everywhere we do vagina examination? What is the reason? What is the importance? These are some of the importance in front of you. You want to know the condition of vagina, especially not during uh, labor. Vagina should be moist and warm, moist and warm because of the blood supply and because of the fluid there, you know, it's warm, it's moist. It, if it is hot, if you do vagina examination, especially during labor and it's very hot and dry, it means the woman has what we call obstructed labor. It also, we do vagina examination to confirm pregnancy. To confirm pregnancy. When a woman is pregnant, you do vagina examination, you'll be able to know, especially when she's pregnant, you see that the service is soft, you will be able to know whether she is pregnant or not. We also do vagina exam to assess the pelvis. There are certain pelvis which cannot be de cannot deliver easily. We we'll look at the pelvis later. Not all the pelvis can deliver. So you assess. If you don't know the woman, she has come to antenatal clinic. You have to do vagina examination to assess the adequacy of her pelvis. We also, during labor, try to know the stage of dilatation of the woman, of the cervix. Some women, some women come to labor ward and, I mean, they haven't, the labor has even started. And even if labor has started, where is it now? Is it one finger, two, two centimeters, three centimeters? What is it? So we do a vagina examination to know. To know the presenting part of the fetus. Every woman coming to antenata for the first time, the, the midwives or nurses there has to know whether the baby is coming with the botox or the baby is coming with the head. What we call cephalic presentation. No. And also during labor, we do vaginism to, to say whether the head is molding. We look at molding of the fetal head. Molding means the head changing shape here and there. Is it molding? To determine the onset of labor, we said that if you do vaginism nation and the service is closed, the woman is not in labor. Sometimes, we do vagina examination to know the effacement. Those of you who started with me, when we went through the terms, we saw effacement, taking of the cervix. When we are doing vagina examination and any, any pregnancy or labor, when you put your finger into the, the, the vagina of the woman, you touch the cervix. 
And then you see the service is there, later on in labor when touching at the point, do not feel any service again. Say so the first service has a face. And you can know this in through the general examination. After the rupture of the memories, some women come and their memories, fetal memories, structures covering the baby with the fluid inside is lost. So you have to do vagina examination and know where the cord is, where the cord is. It's also done to know if the cervix is well applied to the presenting part. Presenting parts, you know, the cervix is the place where the presenting parts are showing. So is it properly, the baby properly arranged at the presenting part? You can't know this unless you do vagina examination. So that is uh, vagina. We now move on to uterus. But before that, any, any question? Any question on, on vagina? Hello? Hello? Hello, Hello sir. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, please, when we were discussing the internal structures of the vagina, uh, okay. Uh, when we were discussing the internal structures, it didn't make mention of the cervix, so I want to know if the cervix is not part. We are not going to, to cervix. Okay, sir. Uh, vagina service is not part of the vagina. Except that service has gone into the vagina. It's part of the uterus. So, any question again? Otherwise, we move on. <laughs> In front of you now is the slide showing uterus or the womb, uterus or the womb. Uterus or the womb, yes, Ebenezer, yes. <coughs> Ebenezer, your hand is up. Hello? Can we go ahead? Yes. Yeah, the uterus is a hollow organ. If you want to know the uterus, then just pick a pear, a pear, the fruit pear. It's just like that. The main body of the uterus and the cervix. <laughs> Is there, yes, Ebenezer Jampra? All right, so this uterus is situated in the true pelvis. This uterus is situated in the true pelvis. Please, can you ask your question? Two people have raised their hands. Sir, there are some questions in the chat box. If you can attend to, thank you. Pardon? There are questions in the chat box. Okay. Thank you. Okay, what, what I've read here, somebody's asking whether the, um, 
Padana can go back to each state after the delivery of the baby. We haven't read that level yet. We'll talk about that. So I, I think that, <laughs> that what I'll say now, currently what we are doing is the anatomy and physiology of the female reproductive system. We'll come to all these questions that you have asked. So let's proceed. When you look at the uterus, it's in the true pelvis. Again, as I said, the female pelvis will go to it later. And it is in front of it. It is situated in the true pelvis with the bladder in front of it. A rectum behind, just like that of the vagina. It's, the, the uterus bladder is on the top. And what they, uh, what do we call it? Uh, rectum is behind. It received the insertion of the fallopian tubes at its upper and outer ends. In a non-pregnant state, the uterus is 7.5 centimeters long, five centimeters wide, and uh, um, and wide at its widest part and 2.5 centimeters wide thick. In the non-pregnant state, we are talking of non-pregnant state, the uterus is 7.5 centimeters long, five centimeters wide, and wide and its widest part and is 2.5 centimeters thick. Still in non-pregnant stage, the uterus weighs 60 grams, non-pregnant. Like if some of my sisters here in me, they are not pregnant. Then the uterus weighs 60 grams. But as soon as the woman becomes pregnant, the weight changes to 1,000 grams. The weight changes to 1,000 grams. And it, will, and it will be the size of watermelon so you see the watermelon those of you who like watermelon you see when the woman becomes pregnant that is the size but when the woman is non-pregnant it's like a pear shape pear shape so it is as i said shaped like avocado pear so anytime you see avocado pear, it's exactly the shape of the uterus. That small and then that head there is cervix, and the other is the body of the uterus. So this is the diagram I would like to show you and look at here. Look at this is the uterus. I hope you are seeing it. That is the uterus, you know. And the posterior, this is the posterior. That is the rectum. And then you have the anterior, that is the bladder. And you have this fallopian cheek inserted. You know, and this is the vagina, you know, just for this vagina. So that is the vagina. These are the pockets we call furnaces. And this small part of the uterus is the cervix which is inside the vagina. <laughs> I hope you appreciate what yeah, I'm showing you now. So let's, let's, let's do some discussions. Position and attitude. Position and attitude of the uterus. Normally the uterus is in, a, is in an attitude of antiversion. I'll go back to the diagram and when we say anti what we mean is that the uterus tilt forward over the bladder. <coughs> Sorry. anti position, uh, attitude. anti -version. And then we have anti-flexion. It flexed over itself. It bent over it on itself. 
at the level of internal odds. We see the internal odds just now. So this is, let's go back to the diagram. That is the bladder. So this is the uterus bending over the bladder. So anti vesh anti vesh Then here you see the cervix. It's like the uterus is bending, bent around this place on each side before it bends on the bladder. So that is the anti-flexion. It flex on itself and then before it flex on the bladder with anti -version. So we have a bent on itself at the level of internal os. Note, this bending, bending, anti-flexion, anti, anti changes. When the, it depends on the degree of the distension of the bladder. If the bladder is full, it raises the uterus and it changes the attitude of the uh, of the uterus upward. Let's let's go back to the diagram. When the bladder is full, it pushes this uterus and make it straight, so this bending will go away. Similarly, when the uterus has a baby there, it raises the uterus and then the anti flex flexion and anti vesion all this thing will go away and the uterus becomes straight. So it depends on the uterus itself and that of the bladder, the attitude. So in other words, the attitude can change. So the attitude of the uterus depends on the degree, as we said, sorry. Now, this uterus, we are going to divide it into various sections. When we come to labor, you see that each part of the uterus play a very important role. So we are going to divide, they are all one uterus, but because of the specific functions, uterus is divided into areas. We start with the body of the uterus, which we call corpus, corpus. This is the main part of the uterus, the body of the uterus. And it extends from the insertion of the fallopian tubes to the cervix. It extends from the section of fallopian tube to the cervix, the body encloses the cavity. Let me go back to the diagram. You appreciate it. This is the, this is the body of the uterus, body of the uterus, this one. This is the body of the uterus, uh, you know. The, that, that is the body of the uterus and the, it extends from the insertion of the fallopian tube to the cervix, and the body includes the cavity. Again, let me go back, and then for you to see, that is the cavity, this is the cavity, and the body of the uterus, this is cervix, so it starts from here to the, to where the insertion of the piston, and with, with this diagram, you may not say, but the, at least we are making a point that body of the uterus includes this cavity. And this is where the baby will come and lie and get attached to the body of the uterus. And then we have the, we have the fundus. This is the upper part of the uterus lies between the insertion of the two fallopian tubes, two fallopian tubes. And then we have cornua. These are lateral angles at the upper corners of the uterus where the fallopian tubes are attached. And then we have the cavity, the triangular shape uh, space inside the uterus. It base is directed uppermost. The apex is what? Towards cervix. Now, then we have isthmus. Before I go to isthmus, let me go back to the diagram. The structure there. This is this is the fundus where my my the the punta is. That is fundus. That's the fundus. And then when you come to uh, cornea, cornea is is immediately a, a point where this one fallopian to get into the uterus. That where you have the cornea, you know. And then you have the Cavity, this is the cavity. 
it's not pro the diagram is not very but it's triangular in shape. That is the cavity. So you have the body, you have the cornea, you have the fundus, you know, you have the asthma. We are now coming to the asthma. When you go to antenatal clinic and they are doing a patient. They tell you that they are measuring the fundal height of the foot from the uterus. They mean here. Because when the uterus is moving, it moves with the fundal height. Fundal height. So these are the path. Remember, they are all the same uterus, but these are just parts. They are because of function. Then you have the smarts. This is um, it is a narrow stride, narrow stride. We join the body of uterus to the cervix. Join the body of uterus to the cervix. It is about seven millimeters in length. It's situated above the internal os. It has a special function during pregnancy. Please take note of it. When you get the notion, you are reading. It has a special function during the later part of the pregnancy. It helps to form the lower and upper uterine segment. I'm going back to the diagram. Going back to the diagram. This is cervix. Where the arrow is, is external os of the cervix. Where the arrows are made, it is the internal of the cervix. So when I go here, is the cavity of the uterus. Now, where the internal os is, where the internal os is, what it means is that, what it means is that it's a junction between the cavity and then the cervix. And that junction between the cavity and the cervix, the tissue there, we call it isthmus, and it can stretch, it can stretch, isthmus, and it can stretch. Please, what of the length from the vagina to the cervix? From well, vagina to the cervix, please, I've already given you that vagina uh, measurement, you know. So that is that. So you have the, this, please look at the, the, the arrow again. This where my arrow in my pointer is, is the cervix of the uterus. And here is the entrance of the cervix leading to the vagina. And this one to there's an entrance here leading to the cavity of the uterus. So the junction between the cervix and the main uterus cavity, there is another tissue there, we call it isthmus. The advantage of this uterus is that when the woman is pregnant, it can stretch and create two, two cavities, to create another cavity to make two cavities. And we call that a lower uterine cavity. And then the previous cavity is the upper uterine cavity. So that is the upper uterine cavity. So we move on to Esmos now, uh, the, the cervix now, which we call the neck of the uterus. Cervix or neck of the uterus. This from the lower third of the uterus. It communicates with the uterine cavity at the internal os and below the vagina. Cervix communicates at the internal os and below the vagina, you know, during effacement, when the cervix is going away, when the cervix is entering into labor, final labor, the internal os dilates so that the placenta around the area start to separate. So what they are saying is this, you look, that is the uterus, that is the cervix. I think this place is very clear. That is the uterus, what you are seeing there. You see where my arrow is. That is the external os, and this is the internal os. 
And the junction between, and this is the Savaka Canal. This is the canal of the Salix. And then here is the main neutral cavity, main neutral cavity. Where my arrow have gone up there is the fundus of the uterus. Funda, and where I'm pointing at is the cornea of the uterus, cornea of the uterus. You see, so that is the uterus. Don't forget, this is cervix, cervix. It's part of the uterus, it's part of the uterus, but because of special function, it will look at it later and you see the special function. Now, that is the general description of the uterus, but let's go to the layers of the uterus, layers of the uterus. That's the structure of the uterus. In the question, if I go to the layers, In the question, if I go to the layers, structure of the uterus, the body of the uterus is made up of three cones. Don't forget that the layer of vagina is made up of four cones. The internal structure of the of the svedana is thrown into force we call rugae now this one is made up of three cones that is where my arrow is uh, we call it endometrial endometrial and then where i've sent my arrow now is myometrial and where my arrow has come is perimetrial Please note, take note that is the mayo, the muscular layer of the uterus, that you have the endometrium where the baby gets attached. So this is the perimetrium, this is myometrium, and this is endometrium. Now, one interesting thing about it, I'm going to trace the, the, the endometrium. When you come down, 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 you see that. The endometrion, the endometrion continue into the cervix, but their structures, what we finish, you see that they are different. Then if you look at here, that is the inner layer of the vagina, and it also contain into it affects the cervix. The cervix, this part of the cervix is the inner layer of the vagina. So let's look at the structures quickly. And uh, from the inner lining of the uterus, made up of columna ciliated. Please take note. Columna ciliated epithelium. In with their numerous glands, secreting mucus. Every, every structure which has uh, glands secreting mucus. These glands <laughs> are called stroma cells. The glands found in, they are called stroma cells. The endometrium varies. Please take this, this, um, when you get the new you are reading, take it, it varies, it varies. An endometrium of the uterus varies every month during menses. It is shared every month. It is shared. This one, endometrium, it changes every month. But you see, when you trace the endometrium up to the cervix here, up to the cervix here, this one does not change. It's only the upper part of the uterus, endometrial, which, which changes. So the, it doesn't change at all. So the, the important thing is you know the endometrial, endometrial in the, in the uterus changes. The functional layer, what do you mean by functional layer? Please come again, come over again. 
at what is the functional layer. So you have you have endometrium completely shared at each menstrual period up to the basal layer. We look at the basal layer when the woman becomes is going to menstruate. The endometrium also divides into four layers: compact layer, perforation layer, basal layer. So many layers. So it is shared up to the basal layer. Then you move on to mayo. Mayo metron is the coat. It's where the muscles are. You know, composed of muscles arranged in all directions. Arranged in all directions. These muscle fibers are interlaced with each other when the patient is not pregnant. And it becomes well defined when the patient is pregnant. That is, we are talking about this layer. That is the myometron, myometron, and create a lot of muscles. We have circular muscles, we have longitudinal muscles, and then we have another type of muscle we call crisscross muscle, crisscross, which it crisscross. In the form, in a in a way that it even form a structure sim, similar to age, so we call it figure of age, and its function is to arrest bleeding after delivery. So, the the muscle area of the uterus is myometrium. The fiber that's why right, the inner circular layer. Crisscross middle layers and longitudinal layers. Now let's see the most distributed inner circular around seven cm cornea and crisscross the figure of eight around the blood vessels of the uterus, around the blood vessels of the uterus. And then we have outer longitudinal layer which running from the internal os in front uh, over the fundus and down to the external os. So that is the... Then we have the outer coat, outer coat of the uterus, three layers. It is made up of what? Pelvic peritoneum. It covers the posterior aspect of the uterus up to the cervix where it formed the recto vagina porch, or porch of dog glass, or porch of dog glass. It does not cover the size of the uterus. It is therefore forms a direction over the uterus, which is sometimes referred to as broad ligament. Anteriorly, it formed the recto, recto visca porch. So that is perimeter. Let me go back and show you the, I've already showed you, but that is perimetron. Perimetron is this, this one. And this is the muscular layer of the uterus, which is myometron. And this is the endometron, which is shared every month during menstruation. And, uh, the, the, that is also where the baby comes and then lodge itself before it goes to the cavity. So that we are making a progress, endo, mayo, and then peri. And then we have the blood supply. Please read about them. Which blood supplies go to the uterus, uterine arteries, and then ovarian artery, you know. So lymphatic supply. Let's go to the relations of the uterus. Relations of the uterus. Anteriorly, the uterus is related to the bladder. I've already shown you the diagram. Utero visca porch and the pelvic bone anteriorly. In other words, on top of the uterus. At the back of the uterus, the uterus is related to the rectum, porch of the glands, and uterosacral ligaments. Posteriorly. What we mean posteriorly and anteriorly, the most important structures 
we are very much interested and concerned is the bladder and rectum. On the top of the uterus, when the bladder is full or the rectum is full, it deserves labor. When the bladder is full, the baby coming will be slowed down. When the rectum is full, is full the same thing will happen. And it can lead to problems in delivery. So when the bladder is full, normally what we do is to catheterize the woman and remove the urine before the woman delivers. When the rectum at the posterior is full, normally the women are given some enema to wash, the, the, uh, wash out the content of the rectum before the woman delivers. The laterally, and the size of the uterus, you have the fallopian tubes, you have the ovaries, you have the ovarian ligament, blood vessels, lymphatics, and the nerves. And then inferiorly, down what you have there, the, uh, inferiorly, the uterus is related to the vagina. Support and ligament. The uterus is just not standing on its own. It's supported. And the main support of the uterus is the pelvic floor muscles. We'll look at them later. Pelvic floor muscle, pelvic. The pelvic, we know, is not just bony. It has structures. It has muscles that make it soft for the organs. In addition, there are other ligaments on either side apart from the broad ligament, which are the folds of the peritoneum. The uterine ligament are strong fibrous floor muscles. They keep the uterus in position. So these are the attachments. Take this attachment very serious. These are the structures holding the uterus, in addition to the pelvic floor muscles. We have uh, two transverse cervical ligaments, uterosacral ligament, bobo cervical ligament, round ligament, and broad ligament. When we do pelvis, you understand all these things. And when you get the news, you are ready to do understand. Then what is the function of the uterus? Contains, protect, and nourish the product of conception. Two, the uterine muscles are very useful in labor. The myometrium, the muscles in the myometrium, they contract and push the baby out from the uterus. The longitudinal muscle fiber, which form crisscross, which form crisscross. Normally, in the third stage of labor, when the bleeding is supposed to occur, it arrests the blood, the, the, the blood vessels and then prevent bleeding. Uterus expel the product of conception at full term when the baby is about to deliver the muscles will push the baby out. Five, it involates following job. I think somebody asked me a question you know, how will the uterus come back? You know, uterus Vagina, fallopian tubes are pelvic organs, pelvic organs. So when the woman becomes pregnant, it goes to the abdomen and after delivery, it comes back. And the term we use is involution. So uterus will help the structures to involute. Now, the next part of the uterus is cervix. I've already talked about that. The next part of the uterus is cervix. So let's look at cervix. Look at cervix. Somebody asked, say, uh, what causes blighted ovum? I don't, I don't understand. But I don't understand what is blighted ovum. But wait, when we go to ovaries, we talk about ovum. So that's, it's a, uh, when we go to the ovaries, uh, we talk about ovum, then maybe your question will be answered. So, 
So when we talk of cervix, cervix is part of the uterus. It's the lower third of the uterus. Most, which includes the internal and external arch. It enters the vagina at the right angles and is sometimes called the neck of the uterus. Let's go back to the diagram for you to see the description I'm trying to put across. The uterus, this is the cervix. This is the cervix, this part is the cervix and it lies with this external os and this internal os. So this is the cervix. So that is the cervix, it lies between the internal and external os. And, um, and what you should know is that we are going to describe it, but it's part of the uterus. Cervix is part of the uterus. So don't take it differently. It's part of the uterus. Please, uh, some of the questions that you ask, give me the opportunity for us to go forward. You understand everything. What is the funder pressure? Please, we'll talk about all this at the start of the program. Now we are doing anatomy. It will, your, some of your questions will be answered as we go along. When you talk of fender height, fender pressure, we are talking of pregnancy. So the, we have the The cervical canal, you know, we have the canal between the internal os and the external os, we have the canal. And the cervix as a whole tends to be barrel shaped. Barrel shaped tends to be barrel shaped. And um, in adult, that cervix is 2.5 centimeters long and uh, it forms part of the total length of the uterus. So if you know the total length of the uterus, you know, you subtract it from the total length. What is left will be the upper part of the uterus, the cervix. In children, the cervix is the same as the uterus. Uh, during puberty. Uh, during puberty, the cervix should be different from the uterus. And uh, the internal os opens into the cervix and the uterus. The, this opens into the, the internal os, the inside os. When you do vaginal examination from the external os, you go to the internal os before you go to the cavity of the uterus. Then this internal os opens into the cervix and the uterus and dilates during labor. It incompetency, which some people call insufficiency of the uh, uh, the ulcers, result in spontaneous abortions in the mid trimester of the pregnancy. Let me just give you this cervix. Sometimes when people get pregnant, they don't like the pregnancy. They go to the doctors of quack people and. They, they, they force the os open. If you are pregnant and it's not time for you to deliver and you force the, the os open, you continue doing that, you create the weakness of the cervix. And we call that one incompetence of cervix. And anytime you get pregnant, you, you, you get problems with the cervix. The lighted oven is the same as on average gestation. It is a type of pregnancy loss that occurs in any pregnancy, which happens when fertilized. Please, I'm not saying you should give me the definition of it. If you know, keep it to yourself. I'm not saying you should give me any definition. If you know, keep it to yourself. I'm saying that when you ask questions, which we will do later, I will not answer you because it will be a duplication. So if you know, you keep it to yourself. When we ask you a question in the examination, you bring it. 
and see whether it's correct or wrong. So we have congenital anomaly. Dilatation of the cervix during that dilatation to curata can also cause problem with the what, internal os. You know, in what we call dilatation operation or large cone biopsy is carried out when abnormal cervical cells are being found in cytological examination. We are talking of internal os, the os that leads to cavity of the uterus, the os that leads to the cavity of the uterus. When it is being messed up, when it's being messed up, people get pregnant, they go, they go for abortion and the, whoever is doing the abortion for the person put all sorts of things in the cervix. It creates the weakness of the cervix. Sometimes to when they are doing biopsy and they didn't take a correct, correct dilator, it can also weaken the cervix. So that is the that is the internal os. And then we have external. This is the os, normally the midwife touch or doctors that when they do vagina examination. And if the woman is not pregnant, your finger will never enter it. Or if it will enter, it will be difficult for the woman. But when the woman is pregnant, you know, sometimes the cervix is soft, especially in multi-gravid women. Small, your finger will enter, but it will enter when the woman in the progress is in, is in labor, you know. Now this opens into the vagina. Internal art open into the cavity of the uterus. But this communicates, external art communicate with the vagina. The end of cervical can found at the level of upper border symphysis during the pelvic examination. So in the newly parous woman, if you remember the terms, newly parous woman, Somebody who hasn't got any baby, it is recognized, recognized on vagina examination by being circular in shape, that the external os smooth with the dimple in the center. When you take the scan of it, you see it's circular with the dimple. After 36 weeks of pregnancy, the dimple will admit a finger. But in a multi-gravity, multi-gravida woman, a woman who has so many pregnancies and there were so many children, you know, it is transverse, slit-like aperture with an irregular edge and will easily admit a fingertip, even in any pregnancy. And therefore, we call it multiple ors, multiple ors. So the Savaka Kana, let me, the, the, the Savaka Kana, let me go back to the diagram. I'm interested for you to see the Savaka Kana. No, Savaka Kana. So that is the cervix, as that is the cervix. This is the cervix. This is the external os. This is the internal os. And this is the Kana. That's the Savaka canal. External, internal os lead to the cavity. External os lead into the vagina. So that is the canal. And this canal, Savaka canal has internal, external, we'll talk about that. And the spindle shape, it's not straight. It's spindle shape. And the cervix has three layers, just like it's a part of neutral. So it has three layers. The first layer is endometrium. And the endometrium here is the innermost layer, just like neutral. But the difference between that one and that of the neutral is that it's ciliated. It has cilia, it has projections. And the ciliated. <coughs> Ciliated gland, the this uh, body is called abor vitae, tree of life. What is the cilia do? 
when a man puts sperms into the vagina and it enters the cervix, it pushes, it helps, it facilitates the passage of the sperms to the fallopian tubes. You know, it helps in the passage of the sperms. The force allow dilatation. This uh, cilia to also allow dilatation of the cervix to occur without injury. Without injury. Then they, in the multi-gravid mother, above beta become flattened out with successive pregnancies. The cervical endometrium is more glandular than that in the main body of the uterus and it's not shared, it's not shared. Please take note. Endometrium in the uterus continues to the cervix, but that of the uterus is shared during menstruation. But the endometrium in the cervix is not affected by, by, by menstruation. And it also has cilia, which we call abovita. And the function of the cilia is to push the spares. Nevertheless, it's affected. It is yet affected by hormone estrogen at the time of ovulation. And this, and there is an increase in glandular secretion, which also becomes less viscous during ovulation. The massive layer is involuntary massive layer that is the endometrium, endometrium part of the of the cervix. We call it massive. We call it massive layer, and it's not like that of endometrium in the the cavity of the uterus. Then collagenous tissues will give the cervix a fibrous nature. The relative proportion of each person depends on her hormonal level. Longitudinal muscle fibers from the uterus pass into the cervix, but there is a preponderance of spinal fibers, which run in both uh, both clockwise and anti-clockwise direction and lie in the circular formation in the cervix. Although the amount of muscle fibers in the uterine body is increased, considerable during pregnancy, histological studies show that there is negligible increase in the cervix. And then we have peritoneum, remember, you have peritoneum in the uh, uh, per, uh, perimetron in the, in the uterus. This is why we have peritoneum covers that part of the cervix which lies above the vagina. It is loosely applied in the area where it reflects up and covers the bladder. The intra, intravaginal cervix intravaginal cervix has an outer coat of stratified epithelium, which is continued with the vaginal lining. It continues a short distance into the cervical canal to meet the cervical endometrium at the squamocolumnar junction, the commoner side of what? The cervical cancer. Let me quickly, what I've just read. I think I've shown it to you. The, the cervix area, the cervix area, this part of the cervix, this is cervix. Uh, this part of the cervix is the endometrium. That is the endometrium, which has some projections. We call it abovitae, which sweep the sperms into the cavity of the uterus. Now, when you come here, is the continuation of the what? The inner wall of the vagina. And when you go inside, the junction where the inner wall of vagina meets the endometrium, there are the cells there, which normally develop into what we call cervical cancer. Cervical cancer. So that is the, the cervix, that is the cervix, and then we also have support, the support of the cervix. 
and vasic, the vacal ligament, bubus, the vacal ligament, and uterosacral ligament. But what, what is the function of the cervix? It has to prevent infection entering the uterus. So if an, a microorganism escapes the acid of the vagina and enters service, service can destroy it. It dilates and withdraws during labor. When the woman is in labor, don't forget the effacement is taken up, cervical us open, and then open up, and then the fetus and the placenta will be born. Following delivery, it returns almost to its non-pregnant state. We look at that later when we are doing pregnancy. And anteriorly, anytime we say anteriorly, we are talking of the one in front of the woman. We have utero vesicle pouch and peritoneum and the bladder. Posteriorly, we have pouch of dog glass and the rectum, you know, and laterally the broad ligament and ureters, which are crossed by the uterine arteries. Now we have the fallopian tubes. Any question? Any any question on the cervix and uterus, uterus in general? The question on uterus in general. Are you there? Yes, sir. All right. So let's, yes, let's go on to uterus. Uh, Raymond Ba. Raymond. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, sir. So I wanted to know if cells can cause opening of the external walls of the service. Never. Okay, sir. Uh, it will not cause. The internal and external also are open when the woman is ready to deliver. So good question. So now we have fallopian tubes. Fallopian tubes. Now before I, we are almost ending the lecture, I want to tell you that hopefully next week, whilst we are doing anatomy, we're doing the pregnancy as well. So two hours, I will divide the lecture into two so that we appreciate what we are doing. The structures are supposed to relate to the pregnancy. So what we are doing, the anatomy, we'll, we'll, we'll use one hour to do anatomy and then maybe one hour to do the pregnancy, to, to do the uh, midwifery itself. I hope yeah, it's clear to you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the fallopian tubes, we have two, two in both sides, fallopian tubes. We have two. Somebody wants to ask, fertilized egg attaches to the uterine wall and the gestational sac forms, but no embryo develop. What is the meaning of this question? What is the meaning of the this question? You know, it's not a good question, please. Uh, what is it? All right, so no question. You, people, relax. You are bringing hoodious charts. The charts are very hoodious. So let's, at the end of the day, that's why we are here with you. At the end of the day, your mind will be clear with obstetrics. You know, the labor, pregnancy, anatomy, whatever, the child, pregnancy, whatever. So there, there, are, there are two types, two, um, all right, so I'm happy you have accepted to wait for me so that when we do, you, you understand everything. All right, fallopian tubes are two. Uh, and I have to assure you that everything that's important to us, God has given us two, 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 two. Because fallopian tubes is the site of fertilization. 
So God has given two. One one is spoiled, one will be there to work for the woman. And it opens to the to the peritoneal cavity near the ovaries, near the ovaries. And each tube is eight to 40 centimeters in length. The thickness, the thickness varies from two to three millimeters in diameter. Nah. And the narrow is most, five to eight, and the widest portion and ampulla. Now, we mentioned isthmus, we divide the cervix from the, the, the cavity of the uterus. We have another cervix. We have, a, sorry, sorry, we have another isthmus in the fallopian tube. This isthmus is very, very, we will hear it important very soon. You know, it has muscles which open medially to the trunk cavity. And this shows how infection is in the genital tract can easily affect the pelvic and organs. If you get microorganism entering the vagina, it can enter the cervix, enter the uterus cavity, go to the fallopian tubes, and then fall into the abdomen and, and infect other organs. So that is the, the of the cervix. Um, these are the parts of the cervix. Take note of them. Interstitia part, isthmus, ampulla, and infandibulum. Interstitia part, isthmus, ampulla, and infandibulum. That is how it's arranged. Let's take them one by one with interstitia parts. Measured 1.25, and that is the part embedded in the uterine cavity. Each lumen measured about just one millimeter in diameter, and is the narrowest part of the tube. And then we have isthmus measured 2.5, and is the narrowest part immediately adjoining the uterus, and is slightly wider than the interstitial part. Look at its function. It not reserved, it's a reservoir, reservoir for spermatozoa. Remember, we said that sperm, sperm is kept in the woman for a week before it dies. It is kept in isthmus of the fallopian tube, not isthmus of the cervix. You know, the temperature there is very good for the sperm. And then we have the ampulla. No. There is the widest portion, 5 centimeters, 5.1 centimeters length, the dilated portion, extending from isthmus towards the side walls of the pelvis. And it is the place where fertilization takes place. The place where, and then finally we have finger-like structures. We call them infantibulum. 2.5 in length, it is the funnel-shaped extremity. It is fibrillated at the end with one fibula extending to and in the contact with ovary known as fibula ovarica. So that is the, look, let's go back to the diagram I've been showing you. The diagram I've been showing you, there's a, uh, that, that is the, this is the, That's the fallopian tube here, yeah? fallopian tubes. You know, when you continue just here, yeah? that's where you have the isthmus. Then you have the interstitia. When you go inside, let's, when you go inside, you have what we call ampulla. That's where the fertilization takes place. And then you come to, you see, uh, when I give you a diagram to do what you do, you see that there are some finger-like structures, you know, of the fallopian tree. And that is what we call infantibulum. One is very long. When you have the nose and you are looking at it, you see that one is very long. It touches the, it touches the ovary. And that is the, that is the, the, uh, uh, that I'm coming, please. 
fallopian tubes in fundibulum. That is we call ovary. That femoral ovarica is the one which picks the egg from the ovary and put inside the 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 the, the fallopian tube so that fertilization can take place. Then the structure, four coats, the outer coats, is peritoneal covers the top. Then the two coats in the muscle, the, the, the outer coat, then the second coat has muscle layer, just like the others, the vitina and circular. And then we have soft layer, soft layer, or soft mucous layer of connective tissue, you know. Now, the most important thing I want to mention in the fallopian tube is also thrown into folds, also thrown into folds, and we call it placa. Don't forget, we guy in the vagina, above the thigh in the cervix, and then we have placa in the, in the, in the fallopian tube. Some parts are not related. This, uh, not every part of the fallopian tube tube is thrown into folds. Some parts are not thrown into, into folds. And um, after the discharge of the secretion, uh, some parts are not seated and they contain cells known as doublet cells, which are full of secretion, which is discharged into the lumen soon before the menstruation. Um, those after the discharge of the secretion, the goobler cells collapse and what is known as PEC cells. The purpose of this secretion is to keep the lumen lubricated and moist. The sweeping movement of the cilia helps to propel the oven and spread along the tube. Uh, I think uh, the time is almost up. Any question? Any contribution? Any concern? before we meet next week. Are you there? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, please. Uh, Matthew, Matthew Nagib. Yes, your hands are up. Uh, please, I'm Dr. Shaban. Okay. Yeah, contact your prefect. Yes, Dr. Shaban. Yes, madam. Uh, contact your pre. I think we have talked about this since last week. Uh, the, the representative, if you are ready, I'll bring them to him. So that you get, but we need to get the news and read. Uh, so, Nadiva, okay. Okay, doctor. Do you okay. have objective at the back? Pardon? Do you have objective at the back? Hey, my, my brother. <laughs> Why do you need the objective? Why uh, don't you that... read the book and understand? All this you are mentioning, you are not, you, you, you can't keep them unless you read. And it's when you read that you get the objective. Don't you see that? that? Santa, I'll just give us an insight to you. Anyway, we did. You're my master, Matthew. <laughs> uh, Thank you. This is the side and the length of vagina in every woman the same, of course. And if you get the question I'm having here, please, is the side and length of vagina in every woman the same? The anatomy I'm giving you is the same, but we are talking of human beings, if there's variation, that's a different issue. That will be studied in gyne. That's studied in gyne, okay? So, before I take leave of you, the lectures start the, um, what do you call it? Supposed to start 145, then end at 345, and somebody will come in. So, please, punctual so that uh, 
I'm going to use one hour, hopefully, where we have reached now to start pregnancy. And uh, but we'll, we'll do it hand in hand with anatomy. They will be talking of pregnant fertilization and how pregnancy takes place. So if you want any information, please contact your prefect. I'm online with him. I believe he's listening to me so that uh, we, we organize ourselves and then know exactly what you're about. Please, is the side and the length of vagina? And, oh, I've answered that. Sir, please, this lies the soft copy. What do you mean by soft copy? Uh, what do you mean by soft copy? Come over again, please. Please say uh, the lecture uh, note. He means the lecture notes. Yeah, that's what I said you should collect, the lecture notes. This is just a PowerPoint. PowerPoint, you don't teach people to learn with PowerPoint. That is not correct. We are not teaching you to learn and just pass examination. We are teaching you to know obstetrics, all your courses as a nurse who have done the university degree. You understand? We are not teaching you, we are teaching you to know obstetrics or to know medicine. But not that this one is to make it easier for us to teach you. So that is that. All right, so let's let's end it here. Thank you for us to meet next week. Hopefully, when we are alive, grief to Almighty Allah for that, so that we all assemble again to do the program and to do the lecture.